Ladies and gentlemen, my Zara Mosin is from Yutimara. She is one of our most celebrated here in the United States. And before she went off to prep, we managed to ask her, ask her a few interesting questions. And this is how we're going to introduce her tonight. Question number one. If you were in the amazing race, which member of the Edge Corps would you most likely team up with? And her answer was Tariq Mehta. Because Nizera would come up as the more, um, as the leading uh, individual in that team. Second question is, your most memorable debating memory is? And her answer is, losing three consecutive ADP finals as opening government. And her third answer to the third question of what is your life's ambition is still unverified because this came from pretty unreliable sources, which were her teammates, um, that she wants to build a cat empire and eventually take over Catalonia. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to invite the first speaker of the affirmative. For the record, I said none of those things. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, in Bangladesh, publishing images that desecrated the Prophet Muhammad incited hatred to the extent of causing indiscriminate public bombings by Islamic fundamentalist groups. In Pakistan, blasphemous statements insulting God led to arson done to Christian schools. In Malaysia, improper use of the word Allah led to the burning of Hindu temples. In all of these instances, affirmative belief that society and majority religious states are exposed to such a severe magnitude of harm that it justifies the implementation of anti-blasphemy laws. And beyond that, side affirmative doesn't only stand by protecting society from the very real reactions to blasphemous statements, but we firmly believe in two principal justifications. That firstly, religion as a concept is sacred enough that it is worth protecting from any attempts of desecration. That secondly, the community has the right to set their own standards of acceptable conduct within their own societal operations. Now before my substantiation, let's make one aspect very clear in terms of what blasphemy laws are referring to. Because these are not fair comments or constructive critiques on religious ideals on what the, or what those religious ideals stand for. These are blatant assaults to either the God, the holy text, or the holy deities and symbols propped up by those majority religious communities, and we don't believe they possess any utility in its expression within any forms of discourses. Let's go on to the substantiation. Firstly, the right to protect society from religious desecration. We believe that the state has always had the imperative to not only protect society from direct and imminent harm, but also to firstly, matters that are inherently offensive to the moral standards of those communities, or secondly, matters that bring latent harm, but which is a subject matter that, sub that incites further harm. We believe blasphemy laws fulfills both of these standards of criteria under the status quo. Let's look at firstly matters that are inherently offensive. Under the status quo, we already outlawed things like public indecency. We believe two elements needed to be upheld in order for us to, uh, in order for us to outlaw anti-blasphemous statements as well. Firstly, is to protect members of committees from exposure to uncontrolled elements of immorality, uh, ladies and gentlemen, because of course, acts of immorality and indecency can exist in any realms of practice of society, be it legal or illegal, but the reason they exist is only based on the degree of involvement that is done on an opt-in basis, because we need to curb the degree of influence that these acts may permeate across society, because it involves a, a more vulnerable actors in society, like children who may be unduly influenced by immoral acts, and from those influences, the majority of society condemns the perpetuation of those acts. Therefore, there's a strong imperative from side government to limit the public display of those actions that we deem as immoral. The second element we believe that blasphemy laws fulfill is the degree of offensiveness that plays a tangible impact onto the minds of the members of society. Because let's make one thing clear. Religion is less about specific practices or specific beliefs. It is about a way of life. Religion prescribes every single facet of your life and is ever present within its nature. Especially when it comes uh, when it comes to things like even eating or studying or learning or interacting with another person. Religion has an undercurrent that belies every single one of those actions. And this is exactly the kind of individual that prescribes this way of life when you talk about majority religious societies. Why so? Because when we talk about the specific context of majority religious states, this is when government and society will be able to reflect their religious ideals within everyone's daily operations because most members of society prescribe to the same religions. So in Muslims, you have restaurants preparing one's prayer ritual for you before you eat, even if without you asking them because most members of the community require that anyways. So these are the kinds of actions 
actions and beliefs that are intrinsically embedded within one's mind, and this uh, and blasphemous statements that do do them no choice but to feel outraged, indignant, and the blatant assault of their identity as a member of those religious communities. So these are the kinds of statements that would be the kind of resentment that is impossible for a person to control within their reaction. It would assault the peace of someone's mind to the point where attempts to disrupt their daily functions within the within the functions within that society. And this is where it leads to the second element of latent harm. Because reactions to blasphemous statements, if done individually, can still be controlled in nature. But in the context where the majority of society possess the same level of anger, the same level of indignity within that, you create a bubble where individuals can validate each other's anger within those communities as well. You allow each other to have those anger gain traction within this community and let it become a tangible vehicle of outrage in reaction of those statements. And those validation necessarily outweighs any other deterrence from that, say, the legal system to not bomb a person or assault another person. Because when you have that bubble of validation, you gain moral legitimacy from each other's angers and from finding an outlet that is justifiable enough in reaction of those things. This is when even moderates within those religions are pushed towards a framework of radicalization because they exist within that community where everyone else is similarly as angered as well. For those two reasons, there exists a level of harm that is latently caused to, to the rest of the members of society and this is in line with things such as outlawing hate speech or things that are outlaws defamation laws where they can be latent harms in reaction to the publication of those statements. For those two reasons, we believe there's a strong imperative on the side of the government to protect society from the very public publications of these statements. Secondly, let's talk about the trade-off on the sacrifice of rights. Because necessarily, what is the value of any single expression? And this is in terms of defending the people who are publication, public, uh, publishing those statements. You believe there can be two things that are arguable. Firstly, what is the utility of the contribution of those statements within the discourse? And secondly, whether it is a mere outlet of any particular individual. In terms of utility, we think that Balsamer's statements are destructive rather than constructive because of the very nature in which it was addressed. There are a multitude number of alternatives in which these individuals can try to express their thoughts without offending any single person, and those alternatives are not being used up under status quo and fulfills the quality of being a blasphemous statement. But secondly, if someone is allowed to express something merely for the sake of expression, we believe that A outlets can exist without it being placed on the public sphere where it can have adverse impacts on other persons, but B, Governments have long restricted anyone expressing anything just because they want to if there exists either third party harms or societal harms, societal harms in this nature. And we believe those criteria are also being fulfilled. Because what is the trade off if you allow these blasphemous statements to exist? We believe that firstly, even in the worst case scenario, you, uh, you allow for a blatant uh, perpetuation of harm in terms of tangible reactions, in terms of the bombings and arson that I pointed out to you before. But secondly, even within the best case scenario, this is a huge infringement on the people, uh, on the people's right to live without being offended, and the trade-off is merely a mere expression that ne doesn't necessarily carry any single value within those communities. Ladies and gentlemen, blasphemous statements are not constructive towards the discourse of the people that we exist within reality. These are statements that directly insult the majority of society, and when carried with the detraction of those contexts. Can, be, can become very violent and very tangible harms that the rest of society is made vulnerable to. These are very strong justifications to outlaw that we lost. For those reasons, we are very proud to from the policy. I'd like to invite the first speaker on the, on the negative bench to open the case on behalf of the negative bench. <laughs> Team that 
there are some people in these countries who don't actually want to be religious, but never get the opportunity to talk about the ideas that they feel are natural to them. But we'll deal with that and substand it. But on the streets of Catholic Manila or Islamic Kuala Lumpur, people are respectful. They're dignified because they have no incentive to alienate their friends, their families, and their community leaders. And when challenged by petty forms of blasphemy, their faith is robust. They're able to rest assured that their strength and their position on God is not challenged significantly. The only actor in this, in this debate who has an incentive to exercise this policy is the state. Because the state has an incentive to define blasphemy in whatever way it chooses, whatever values at the time suit them, and persecute people based on what it thinks is right. But more importantly, this allows individuals to be able to report on a subjective measure of offense and punish other individuals within their community based on whatever they like. We think this is a fundamentally wrong premise to set the majority of religious states who are happy to oppose. Three points in a bottle. Firstly, on the imperative of this debate, which were the bombings, the rallies, and all sorts of violent protests which occurred as a result of a highly religious society. First response, punish the terrorists, but punish the violent people for the crimes that already exist. We don't have to enact a law that censors the way people think. But more importantly, these are actions of a minority that exploit the values of other people to mean that they can railroad discussion, they can distract from the key issues of those particular uh, countries. They point to examples like defamation and hate speech. Here's why they don't fit in this debate. Defamation, you can quantify a financial uh, harm that was accrued to your reputation. It doesn't fit in with the realm of accruing a subjective harm of offense. Hate speech is not allowed in some countries to be criminalized, but more importantly, it is designed to incite violence. It is designed to, to make sure that society is perturbed. Blasphemy is just an opinion you can have, which brings me neatly to my second point. Unclear for the affirmative team how blasphemy will be perceived within the community. The vague definition we got was that it is inherently offensive to some people. The point is that is different from person to person what is inherently offensive. The fact that my teammates seem to presume that I'm Muslim is inherently I'm sorry, not Muslim, Hindu. <laughs> the fact that I conflated them and exposed that I'm neither religious. The, more, the way that this model will be exercised is how it's been done in Malaysia, which is that for the, for the Malay Bible, you are literally not allowed to use the word Allah because it offends the, ma the majority that made that law. We think that that is an incursion on their rights in a way that is pernicious. We don't see why that should occur based on what the state decides is religious. And I'll bring you examples of my speech as to why divisions within religion prosper religious progress rather than stunted and why that isn't necessarily offensive. The final thing they wanted to talk about was the influence that this particular uh, proposal, the status quo, would have. They started the speech talking about the riots that occurred, but then within the argument they told us the most important stakeholder were the children, which I don't actually think were the perpetrators of those particular riots. But those are the people whose <laughs> ability to engage with information is already controlled severely by their parents, by their families anyway, to the point where they can't opt out of that religion. That is a bad thing if they can't then talk about things that come to their mind. For example, mom and dad, why does God exist? Can you explain that to me? That could be construed as blasphemous under the affirmative definition. More importantly, and the second response to this is, when individuals are empowered to capitalize on their ability to perceive something to be as subjective as they want, and report to the police, this is what I've been blasphemed upon, that is an inherent imbalance in power between those individuals. And the fact that the affirmative team does not outline what the punishment for this will be is telling. The way that this is enacted in the Philippines is that people can be incarcerated as a result of being found to be blasphemous. And the definition of blasphemy is to criticize the, the church, the Vatican church. We think there is eminent criticism that can be made of religious institutions, and they need to be without being thrown into jail. Okay, first point of substantive. Freedom of speech, it's important. So from a democratic perspective, we think that there has to be a high bar before you, you incur upon the right to freedom of speech. We think the only bar that we're willing to concede is when you incite violence upon other people because there is an obvious, tangible, a tangible and a universal harm. This offence does not fit under either of those categories. We think that people in Australia who looked at Piss Christ and turned away, which is an artwork, which I don't actually think is a very good artwork anyway, some people thought that was offensive, but some people thought it was nothing. The subjectiveness of offense is important. In the Philippines, uh, religious symbols were denigrated with, denigrated with pictures of bombs and other uh, un unsaleable things to talk about at this point in time. We think that those, the offense that you can derive from that is inherently subjective to you. In the states where this is enacted, 
in the majority of religious contexts, the people within those states have no ability, if we look at the most religious characterization the affirmative you want to bring out, no ability to opt out of the religion that they have been co-opted into. Why is that? Because their families, their friends, and their communities also believe in that. They have to opt out of that too. What are the harms of this proposal? Set, first of all, sets the precedent that the states can encroach on your rights as and when it chooses to. That's bad. I and mean, they are able to exploit your core values in order to do so. Secondly, that other individuals are able to control the exercise of your rights. That's obviously bad. Okay, second point of substantive. Given that offense is so subjective, it is impossible to self-regulate this. You don't want to run the risk that you're going to alienate somebody else and they're going to report you and you're going to be incarcerated. You just won't say anything. That's bad for two big stakeholders. Firstly, for religious people. Secondly, for non-religious people. For religious people, the most important developments in religious history have been when people disagree. Look at the Reformation within the Christian history. Martin Luther said, actually, priests are the conduit for religious faith, the individualist, that has shaped modern Protestant Protestantism as, it, as, as we see it today. That, was, that disagreement was important. If we look at disagreements between Sunni and Shia, some people believe that you should elect your priests. Some people believe that they were divine by God. You need to have these disagreements in order to decide which religion you, you belong to. This prevents progress. For non-practicing people, we can look to the Philippines to say, to see the Reproductive Health Rights Bill has not been passed for 14 years by the Senate because it was seen to be blasphemous to say a woman has a right to an abortion. That affects people's access to basic rights, Madam Chair. This is something, by your conception of what basic rights are, this is something that people should be able to at least talk about, if not enact policy on. We think that this policy fundamentally alienates all of those people. But the third category of people that I forgot to sign for are the people who maybe want to be atheists in their wisdom faith. And just because they don't want to belong to a majority that already exercises power in the policies that affect their lives, they shouldn't also be able to not talk about what they believe in. Madam Speaker, this sets an important precedent for the government to be able to define what affects them at any given moment in time and ossify the values of that particular society. That's bad. You should have absolute freedom of speech unless it causes tangible harm. Happy to applaud. Next, I'd like to invite Jessica Story, second speaker on behalf of Affirmative, to or the case of Time of Affirmative. But before she comes to the stage, I might as well um, read out the answers that her squad gave for the questions that we asked. Question number one, if your speech style has a name, what name would it be? And her squad answered, cool, calm, and cutting. If two of your teammates are celebrities, who would it be? And her teammates answered, Hugh Hefner and Cruella DeVille. <laughs> <laughs> Intelligent debates there, of course, ladies and gentlemen. What is your ideal equity violation? <laughs>
blocking their way of life, when you are blocking their religious symbols, their religious phraseology. We think that's absolutely unacceptable on the basis of like both violent harm and emotional harm. We need some kind of distinction as to why one is different from the other, from the um, negative side of the house tonight, in order for them to get away with their characterizations of this debate. So, three things to talk about. Firstly, why is it legitimate to trade off the right of absolute free speech in order to protect both uh, the, right of the um, physical and emotional rights of others? Secondly, whether blasphemy has some kind of inherent value for changing religion, and thirdly, my substantive material on why this actually reduces the oppression of, of minority religious groups in society. So let's firstly talk about why it's legitimate to trade off the right of absolute free speech in this debate. Because our first speaker came up to you and told you precisely the massive harm this gives to those people's um, way of life. She explained the importance of religion, how to those people it doesn't truly seem to be a choice. So everything that is common, the kind of comments we are talking about, are perceived as an attack on that religion and as a result um, make them feel like they must be, they must defend it, they must act out in order to protect their way of life and who they truly are. What did we hear from the side of the house? Well firstly, we were told in our introduction that people are just inherently comfortable enough in their religion and they don't feel threatened, they're prepared to live in harmony and there will be no reaction. We don't think that's true, we think it completely ignores the material that we were told of <coughs> characterizing what religion means to people and how much it does. Because religion to people who feel it that way, who live in large communities where the religion is the norm, aren't used to that kind of criticism. And when it comes on, when it is granted to them, we think that that means that they are um, as a result, automatically go into a kind of defensive mode where they are able to justify attacks back on that person who was blasphemous because they see it as an attack on them. So we think it's unlikely that these people will always feel confident in their religion. We think they see it more as a justification to lash out back. Secondly, what we heard was that it was only acceptable that directly lead to violent harm. Like I told you in my introduction, we told you that that is exactly what it often leads to. We gave you copious examples of purpose as to when that happens. So we think that we, um, that provides um, a justification in the first place. But secondly, and as I told you, we've talked about the emotional harm that happens, that happens as a result. But thirdly, let's talk about what the response was to our information about violence. What we heard from the New Agent team was, well, it would be a better mechanism to simply punish the terrorists and stop them after the fact in order to try and combat this rather than to limit the hate speech and the offensiveness in the first place. We say this is going to be a completely ineffective solution. Why is that? We think that these people, like they have told you, feel so under attack that that, that kind of calculus doesn't pay off. They're not threatened by that because they feel it is more important to protect themselves, to protect their God, to protect their religion and their families. And as a result, we don't think you limit violence by punishing after the fact. We think the only way um, you can do that is to limit the hate speech in the first place, to protect those people's rights to avoid emotional harm and to protect their own way of life. So, let's secondly talk about whether blasphemy ever leads to a benefit to the community. Because what the Infinity Agent team tried to tell you is that it leads to reform, that it leads to development and discussion and talk within those communities. We say that as, we, as you were told at first, blasphemy is designed to do the opposite of that. It is not constructive discussion. It is designed to undermine and, um, and bring into disrepute the religion in which it is talking about. We don't think it is a constructive form of uh, discourse. Why is that? Why? We think it's inherently uncompromising because it sets out to undermine the religion as a whole and to deny it rather than to engage with it. We think that makes it very difficult for the opposition in the form of the majority religion to engage in response. We think instead it leads to that kind of defensiveness. But secondly, we think it is always perceived as an attack because that's precisely what it sets out to do. While we do support engagement with religion, discussion, interaction between religions, we think blasphemy is the complete opposite of that. In fact, it locks off discussion, it locks off engagement, it locks off change, and it makes those groups more protective, protective of themselves and entrenches their feeling that they are best and that there is a sense of us and them. It entrenches the feeling that that other is out to harm them, is out to persecute them, and so it limits their ability to engage with them in the future 
the course and take what they have to say seriously. So we think that no, absolutely, blasphemy doesn't lead to discourse and discussion in the community. Rather, it leads to further entrenchment, further persecution, further violence, um, and further refusal to change. So let's now move on uh, to my substantive material about how this actually limits the oppression of minority groups in society. We think it's best for the states and for the individuals we're talking about in this, in, in this debate, quite obviously, to have limited religious conflict. We think that it's very difficult under the status quo, uh, sorry, without blasphemy laws rather, to achieve that. Why is that? We think that's because the majority religion always feels threatened by those minority groups in society. That they're always, they fear losing their position of strength in society because of the idea of difference and criticism from those groups in society. So we think the presence of difference means that they always do their best and also manage to achieve it by dint of the fact that they are the majority to uh, oppress and restrict those religious minorities. Why would blasphemy laws change this calculus? For three main reasons. Firstly, we think that by having them in place, the religious minority, the religious majority feels more secure in their position. They feel that, that minority religions are less of a threat and as a result are less likely to go out in time to actively undermine them. But secondly, we think they're less threatened by small disputes and small criticisms from those minority religions. Why is that? They know that there is a lie that those small minority groups are not going to cross. They do not fear escalation. They do not fear, um, so, so, then, so they are less likely to be critical and to lash out and to cause violence in response to small transgressions because they know that there is no ability for that person to go further and start to truly undermine the religion as a whole. We think added to this is the benefit of consistency. When you have a court or a law defining and telling these groups what blasphemy is, rather than just the court of public appeal and riots in the street, it is much clearer what will be threatening, what will not, what will be persecuted as opposed to what will be violently hit out at. Thirdly, we think it's a far better method of dealing with this, when you have a legal mechanism rather than just the court of public opinion. So what does this mean? This means that there will be less violence towards minority groups in society. There will be less, um, there will be more integration and less of a trial of the people having with religious conflict and religious uh, Oppression. We think this is bad for both groups in society. We think under our model, you limit that. We are good. Negative bench. Tan Li Jing from the National University of Singapore. <laughs> she also gets an introduction. Uh, these are the answers that her that her squad mates um, provided us. So the answer to if you were to join the Amazing Race, which member on the Edge Core would you participate with? And her teammates answered mostly Chris because he's cute. I'm not sure, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure what mostly Chris means. <laughs> um, her most memorable debating experience is her first ADP semifinals and breaking for all skills. If her speech was a dish, it would be Sichuan soup because she's hot and spicy, but not everyone can appreciate. <laughs> Thanks, teammates, for those completely accurate answers. So, on the speaking part, though, we think that today. When we talk about blasphemy, we need to talk about what exactly it is. And when it is particularly problematic today, we are confident and able to give us examples of what exactly blasphemy is. Let's assume by the narrowest definition that it goes against what is already stated or the current most like interpretations of the religious text. The problem then would be that we would be unable to discuss things like divorce, because in the Bible, in some interpretations of the Bible it's not allowed, we would never be able to discuss things like homosexuality, because these are things that are most of religions don't currently accept by certain interpretations, not by all. We wouldn't be able to discuss things like reproductive rights, like uh, in the religions. 
And we think that this is, this is particularly problematic because even if we take what their best possible definition would be, they are shutting out certain forms of discourse which we think is problematic. More than that, we think religions are reliant on the fact that they need people to join them and we think it's important for them to therefore be accepting towards more areas of discourse. And that's what we think ultimately we bring today. But I'm going to deal with this, I'm going to deal with whatever they said today in two rebuttals before I go on to my case proper on which other. <laughs> So on the first issue on the idea of what exactly blasphemy is, they claim today that blasphemy is always going to be non-constructive forms of discourse. I have three responses to this. First of all, that we believe blasphemy can be constructive because it challenges current interpretations of what's in the Bible, of what's in the current religious text, and we think it's particularly important in order for religions to evolve. We don't think that the Catholic Church would have allowed women to serve in the church or to go into the church not wearing veils without people actually challenging whether or not this is really what the Bible said. We don't think that homosexuality would become accepted in the church without people constantly challenging what exactly it is they were banning in, um, like, let's say, Leviticus, uh, like, like, if you're going to follow like every single thing in Leviticus, like, where the parents, like, where that, where that, um, like, um, quote comes, that phrase comes from. We think that, like, what exactly are you trying to say? We need to challenge those interpretations. But because these are the existing interpretations, you can't challenge it without necessarily being blasphemous. So we think that even in situations that definitely being blasphemous, which we contest, we think that most of the time is going to be subjective, we say that blasphemy can be constructive, it can move these religions forward, and we think that's important. Second response, we think also that we undercredit these religious people nowadays. We think that the average reasonable person out there who is strong enough in what their religion believes is definitely going to be able to withstand what others say and criticize about their religion. We think it's perfectly easy enough for you to, to address whatever that person has said and allow them to recognize why that is wrong. We think that sometimes people can be accidentally blasphemous and we think that that's when this debate occurs. We don't think that people are going to set out to offend their friends. We think when blasphemy is likely to occur is if you accidentally say something because you're ignorant. And we think it's important for us to protect people's right to say these things. Because then that's the only time in which you can voice it out and we can change the situation or rather we can address it and help them realize that they are wrong. So we think that people should be able to defend their faith without violence. We don't buy that characterization today that violence is necessarily going to occur. In fact, we think that most of the time, the, 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 the rare examples that they, they stated in the introduction of the first speaker, that, that weren't really like, elaborated um, to the rest. They haven't actually given us a situation where a single blasphemous event has somehow led to a great riot and great violence happening. So we don't think that it's particularly fair for you to characterize blasphemy as always leading towards violence because it usually doesn't. And if you're going to tell me that the moment I black, like, you can't, like, you can't, they need to prove today that blasphemy is always going to cause harm. And when they can't prove to that extent, right, we say that we should, on the balance, we would rather prosecute only when blasphemy has caused harm and prosecute those people who act upon those desires to infringe upon the rights of others. We think that blasphemy results in a like, subjective level of offensiveness that most people do not find as harmful as perhaps like actual physical violence. So we don't actually think that this violence is going to occur. More than that, we think most people are going to be able to defend their faith without being violent. But more importantly, the third reason why we say that this is um, going to be a constructive form of discourse is the nuance that my first speaker brought to you. The idea that because this idea that because offensiveness is a subjective thing, what you're going to do is you're just going to shut down discourse. People are going to be less willing to speak up precisely because now they're not sure when you are going to be offended or not. So if you talk about how constructive, if you consider already that discourse can be constructive, you're the one that's limiting the amount of discourse. So we say that when you talk about blasphemy as a non-destructive form of discourse, I told you how it can be constructive, and even if it isn't, we say that more discourse in general is always good. The next thing that they talked about then was how they're going to oppress, how this is going to prevent the oppression of minority groups. Yes, we agree, precisely because your policy is going to make sure that the groups in the majority, that the majority religion is going to be able to perpetuate their religion and ban everything that these minority groups say. And that's precisely why we're going to harm the minority groups even more. They might say it won't happen. But we think that in a situation where the government is dominated by people of a certain religion, when the judges are dominated by people of a certain religion, even if you're not setting out to go against minority religions, you're likely to favor the insults that, that when you know people insult the majority religion, that's the one that's going to get sort of um, that's the one that's going to get punished. Whereas if people um, offend like the minority religions, that's less likely to get punished. And therefore we say that the oppression of the minority not, that we say that the oppression of the minority groups is even more likely to exist. On their side. I'm going to further prove why their policy only exists to help people advance their self-interest and study to, abu to be abused in my substantive on two levels. On how this affects the interactions between the government and the people, and how this affects the interactions between individuals. So first level, right? Um, we think that basically there's an 
idea of this idea, this idea of a self-regulating tandem, that people are likely not to say anything. And therefore, we think this is likely to disproportionately benefit the religious majority. So let's talk about governments. We say that citizens already act as a check and balance. They are able to correct situations where they are, they are able to like accept these levels, uh, or rather when blasphemy occurs, that harm is not necessarily going to affect them. What's going to happen here within democracy is that these anti-blasphemy laws are going to affect policy discourse, but more importantly, it's going to help persecute um, minorities, and it's encouraging the majority religion to be absolutely in like to not to completely like disregard what minority religions say about their religions. For example, we see that like in um, many religions, it, there's this concept that there's only one God. In that situation, where the majority religion says there's only one God, we don't think it's possible for you to ever claim that other religions can even exist because that would be blasphemous by their standards. And precisely because of this, we think that governments, we think that even uh, we think that the governments are likely to use this to persecute the minority religions, whether they like it, uh, regardless of whether they actively want to do so. We think that it's something that's like to occur, and we think that there's a great potential abuse for, like, especially autocratic governments. You see, if we look at the states where um, there are like majority religions, it tends to be places that have less that either don't have a democratic government or have questionably democratic governments. And we say that in these situations, it shuts down discourse further because governments can abuse this to say, um, "You are talking about religion, and I'm going to ban it," even when this is something that's sort of about that's sort of about politics, not really about religion. And we think that it's likely to happen precisely because offensiveness is something that is subjective. Something brought out to me first that wasn't dealt with by them. Because it is so subjective, that is precisely why it is so open to flagrant abuse, especially in democracies, which is even worse because there's now no avenues for recourse. More importantly, between individuals and the religion, we think it's particularly problematic here because it's likely to give disproportionate power to the religious majority, not just the religious majority, but more that within the religion, you're going to get a single homogenous interpretation of the religion rather than many vibrant discussions about the various ways in which, in which religion can be interpreted. We also think that within, like, let's say, in the church or within religious institutions, we think that people who are the current religious leaders are able to enshrine their religious power because they're able to use this law to shut down the discourse by people who may be competing for power by them by claiming that this person has said something that blasphemous. Precisely because it's something that's so subjective, something that they've never really dealt with, we say today that we should encourage this cause and proud to propose. Thanks. Thank you, Lee Jing, for that speech. Next, I'd like to invite Evie Woodford from the University of Sydney, third speaker on side of affirmative. Uh, before she begins her speech, Evie's introduction. Question number one. The two celebrities that she would have as, a te as teammates, Trini and Susanna. <laughs> Member of the Edge Four that she would participate in the amazing race with? Chris, because of his purchasing power. <laughs> <laughs> and her most memorable break night experience? <laughs> Hitting on the, the world's best speaker and then forgetting about it the next morning. <laughs> Let's welcome. Evie Woodford from the University of Sydney. Ladies and gentlemen, to say that the offence someone of Islamic faith gets from seeing the Prophet Muhammad depicted in a cartoon with bombs in his turban is like as ridiculous as saying that someone of a racial minority has like a, a subjective approach to how much they find like racist rhetoric towards them that incites violence subjective as well. We think that when these sorts of blasphemy are not subjective, like the opposition would like to characterize, but are created in a public sphere that incites violence, that attempts to create events, and that actively marginalizes the ability for people to participate fully and actively in these religious communities, we are happy to propose a state which is already religious, protecting the rights of that majority religion to live in the way that they are most happy in doing so. Two questions in this debate. Firstly, how do we justify the right of the government to somewhat limit freedom of speech in the protection of people's ability to fully access their other rights, such as freedom of religion or freedom of participation? And secondly, what sorts of harms come out of blasphemy and like is it a dis like a constructive type of discourse? So firstly, about government incursion into freedom of speech. 
In Steph's speech, she told us that the government only should rarely intervene in freedom of speech. That she was happy to acknowledge instances such as hate speech where the government could regulate freedom of speech because it incited violence. Our first response to this along the bench has been that often, or in most circumstances, even if it doesn't always result in violence, the reason that philosophy is engaged in is antagonistic or is in a way that is violent towards that group or would incite violence in response. We've listed numerous examples that I'll also go into. Things like the um, Hindu nationalists deliberately offending um, majority religions in Pakistan which led to the burning of Hindu temples. Other instances where the prophet, the pictures of the prophet Muhammad led to large scale riots in the streets of various countries. We think that those are instances in which the opposition cannot say that it is merely the minority of cases that lead to violence, but about the fact that it is like a likely scenario. Because secondly, why is it likely that it does incite violence? Because what we think that blasphemy does is calcifies fanaticism. Because now, you perceive your religion as one that is under attack, that needs to be defensive towards those who try to limit its ability to participate. So that religion inherently becomes more violent more oppositional, less able to engage in a higher level discourse and more likely to be angry or violent in response. But thirdly, we don't understand why they're fetishizing physical violence over other forms of violence. We think that what uh, like blasphemy constitutes is a violence against people's religious identities. That for many religious people, people they would value their religious freedom and ability to participate freely without the antagonism and blasphemy of others more highly than they would their physical form. We think that the opposition has been unwilling to engage with a religious state like the ones we're talking about, where people do value religion more than they value their bodies. That is the circumstance in which we think that violence is equivalent. But secondly, what did we hear from the opposition? We heard that offence is inherently subjective, unlike things like defamation. And they pointed to the example of piss price and people's like differing responses what Steph like, acknowledged in her speech was that that occurred in Australia, where there were a myriad of religious identities within that community. We think that it's not highly subjective, people's response to blasphemy, when we're talking about majority religion states, in which things like your religious doctrine tell you what is offensive or blasphemous to that religion. For instance, in Islam, it is like dictated that it is offensive to portray the Prophet Muhammad. We think in those instances that it isn't subjective, that it is objective to people of those religions, what is and what isn't offensive. But secondly, we think that even if you could say that it was like not always completely objective, we think that it is like largely enough consistent that people will receive some level of offense that we'd also be happy to limit it. In the same way as we see laws like public indecency laws, because not everyone would be bothered by naked people walking around in public civilization, but some people would be offended to such a large extent that we're willing to curtail people's ability to do something that they gain only marginal benefit from, like walk around without pants on. We think that this is equivalent in this circumstance, because the fact that Steph only spent 10 seconds of her speech talking about the harm, like the impact that people would get from not, not being able to engage in this sort of speech, was telling you the fact that what we're asking people to give up is fairly minimal. It's not, as the opposition would like to characterize, telling them that they're never able to engage in any sort of rationalization or critique of religion or like intellectual discussion of religion. It's telling them that they cannot depict religion in a blasphemous way. It's telling them that they cannot, in public spaces or in public forums, do things that are blasphemous towards people who are highly offended by that. We think that insofar as you can still get your point about Islam across in other non-blasphemous ways, that what you're losing out on under our model is marginal. But what you lose out under their model is huge. It's people's ability to feel safe and confident and like their state respects their ability to confront their religion. But the second issue in this debate, how does that balance against the harms that come out of this sort of discourse? The opposition spent a lot of time talking about the fact that, you know, blasphemy isn't often intended to be offensive because why would your friends and family be offensive towards your religion? 
that was the point of when this law was actually going to be used. It wasn't like Steph's bizarre characterization of now criminalizing children asking their parents about God. We're talking about criminalizing high profile people from engaging in highly public and highly malicious forms of blasphemy. That's why we have laws that are discretionary in prosecution. So you only prosecute instances of blasphemy where it is hugely against the public interest. We point to instances like a like Dutch far-right uh, Dutch far-right politician who rips off the veil of Islamic women in public spaces to make a comment on Islam, but doesn't actually make that comment in a high-level discourse way, but merely offends. But can blasphemy be constructive? We heard like various analysis about the fact that blasphemy allows for you know conversation about religion within that religion. We think that that is the opposite. We think that blasphemy essentializes that religion to the point where you have to calcify and unify in a way that prevents discourse or internal debate. Because now you have to unify against the opposition which is trying to limit your ability to exercise that religion. You're less likely to have the things that Steph wanted to talk about, like the division between Protestantism and Catholicism. Because now you no longer have a religion that feels safe enough that it can diversify and have debate within that religion. You now have a religion that becomes militant, that becomes antagonistic, that becomes absolutely unwilling to engage in moderation or any sort of discourse in that way. But what else did we hear? We heard that it stops discussion about things like abortion in Parliament. We thought that, as my previous speaker alluded to, that isn't blasphemous if you engage in it in a way that questions the role of abortion in society. If the opposition's argument is that these sorts of states will limit the ability to pass abortion. That's a critique on religion, not a critique on the way that we allow people to protect that religion in states where it's unlikely that religion will cease to be the major determining factor in their lives and their identities. Sorry, the final speaker of the evening and the third speaker of the negative page, uh, Ina Robles from Ateneo de Manila University. You're waiting for my introduction. So her teammates' answers to who from the Edge Corps would participate in, in the Amazing Race, it would be it would be Imran because they're buddies. She would like to be reborn as a rabbit, and if her speech were to be described as a dish, it would be a cake. <laughs> so can you please welcome Ina Robo from Ateneo de Manila? the discussion of the use of contraceptives because it, alle it is allegedly against what God wants. It will allegedly send us to hell. That's why after 14 years, nothing has happened. This is the kind of abuse that you worsen when you give these institutions the power to deem which discussions are valid and which discussions can be allowed in the state because the line between criticism and pure offense can never be drawn. And that's the crucial link that affirmative never gave to us in this debate. Three questions which will show you why negative needs to take this debate. First, which model is better for religion? Second, is it justified for states to enforce anti-blasphemy laws? And lastly, I want to talk to you about minority religions and where we're more likely to protect them. Let's go on to the first idea. Which model is better for religions? Because coming from the first affirmative, she told us that religion is sacred and therefore we need to be able to protect it. We understand that religion is important, which is why we allow them to exist in the status quo and they are free to be able to continue with the rituals and the practices they have in the first place. But what you need to understand is that even religious institutions are imperfect and that's why they need to have an avenue to continuously change in the first place. Because even within religious institutions, there are many different ways of interpreting their Bible, there are different ways of interpreting their Quran, and that's why change still needs to happen. We told you consistently coming from negative bench that change can only happen if you allow individuals to be able to question, if you allow individuals to ask. What was their response to this? The first response is that they told us that constructive criticism can happen in the first place. But the problem with that is they never gave us the link on what the difference is between constructive 
constructive criticism and what offense is. Because if I told the Catholic Church that we need to be able to have female priests, they may take that as an offense against their Bible, but that is also constructive criticism because we don't want these religious institutions to be deemed as sexist. And that's exactly why you cannot separate the two. They never bothered to explain that. But let's rebut their argument in the best case scenario. What if it is purely insulting? And assuming but not conceding, that can be the case. First, we think of it as purely insulting if you are, if you genuinely do believe in your religion. And if your faith is strong, we think you can still practice your religion anyway. You can still continuously pray. We don't think that will be a problem. But on a second level, if it isn't strong, and if you start to question your religious beliefs, which is the harm that they told us, we need to question out, is that really such a bad thing? Is it so harmful to continuously question your beliefs? We, we on negative side are perfectly fine with that because we think questioning your beliefs is much better than blindly following a religion you might not necessarily genuinely believe in. How did we tell you that our model is better for religion? In two ways. First, we told you that if, if religions allow themselves to be criticized in the first place, we think they're going to be seen as less extreme and a lot of people would be more comfortable in opting into these types of situations in the first place. Because in the status quo, what happens is that there are individuals who do want to believe in God, there are individuals that do want to believe in their faith, but they always need to choose between them being a homosexual and not being respected by the church, or them being able to opt in to these kinds of religious activities in the first place. But on a second level, we told you that in a lot of these contexts, these individuals don't necessarily have the choice to opt in that kind of religion, simply because they were born that, they, were, they somehow were born in that kind of location. We think that in that case, we, it's important that you allow these individuals who, who are also stakeholders to, to your religion to have a say. So at the end of the day, we think our model benefits religion because if they feel that these accusations are invalid in the first place, they, the religion has every right and every avenue to be able to oppose that claim. But what we want is we want it to also be fair for these homosexuals and women who are continuously oppressed by these religious institutions as well. The second question I want to answer is, is it justified for states to enforce anti-blasphemy laws? Coming from the affirmative bench, they consistently told us that there exists a hierarchy of rights, that protection from offense should come first than free speech. We told you that firstly, offense cannot be a valid standard because it is impossible to measure. If you take a look at the status quo, everyone can be offended by absolutely everything, and that if that is your standard, you would just never allow people to talk because a lot of us can be offensive to others. But on a second level, we think assuming that ta tangible harm will exist, such as the rallies and killings, we think that to the extent that it becomes violent or that you kill someone, we will arrest you. But we, the second question we need to ask is, are, rally, are rallies always so harmful? Is this disagreeing with the state or the church always so bad? And the simple answer we gave you coming from negative bench is no, it's not so bad. Because offense isn't the ultimate of evil in today's debate, right? Because if you take a look at the way society works, the way we were able to progress now is because at one point we were able to offend the, the mindset of society in the first place. The reason why, let's say, civil rights movement was passed in the first place because Rosa Parks was offended that she couldn't sit in the front of the bus. We think that offense is necessary in order to be able to change things in the status quo, and that's why we're perfectly fine with that. Peace is not value if your citizens' rights are not upheld in the first place, and we would much rather uphold them under a model. Why is free speech such an inherent right that we need to protect in the first place? Because if you take a look at democracies and progressive states, we think it's free speech that separates democracies from all other forms of government, right? It is free speech that separates you from a dictatorship or an abusive regime, because even abusive regimes can have order, right? Even abusive regimes can be able to manipulate you to just constantly follow. But the reason why we have democracies in the first place is because that's the reason why it was created, for us to be able to vote, for us to be able to question, so that individuals can be the checks and balance of the government. Why is that going to be taken away under their scenario? Because given coming from second negative, that we told you that offense can't be quantified, and you're not sure when you say something that's going to offend someone, what's going to happen is that these individuals will continuously censor themselves because they're scared that they're going to be able to offend someone. When that happens, we think that you're essentially remove what democracy means 
you remove what it means to be free, and we think that there's no point in your beliefs if these individuals are not getting the right in the first place. So we don't think it's justified for state to, states to be able to do this. Lastly, I want to talk to you about the minority religions. They tell us that we, we will protect these minority religions if we don't allow blasphemy. We think that's simply not going to happen because the politicians and the institutions that are powerful and the ones that are going to interpret these laws anyway are the ones elected by the majority, are the ones elected by those individuals who are of the majority religion. So we think what's going to happen under their model is you're just going to make this oppression even worse because you do not allow them to be able to voice out their concerns as well. So if you want to talk about protecting minority religions, we think that only happens in our side when you allow them to criticize even the majority religions and you allow them to answer back with the accusations that these individuals are throwing at them in the first place, which is what we want to happen. Because when that happens, we think that's when discourse is going to happen, that's when change is going to happen. What did we tell you ultimately coming from the negative bench? We told you that nobody is claiming that offense isn't a horrible experience to some. What we, we told you that offense shouldn't empower the state to be able to control their thoughts. Should, uh, the state shouldn't allow individuals to be able to abuse this kind of law, and that's why this motion should undoubtedly fall.